You're listening to The Virtue Podcast, brought to you by the Great Hearts Institute. Good conversations around the great conversation. Welcome back to The Virtue Podcast. I'm Robert Jackson, Executive Director of the Great Hearts Institute. And today we're going to be spending some time with a gentleman who has been extending that great conversation right now in our day. He's definitely committed to classical liberal arts education. And I would like to welcome Dr. Mark Bauerlein. Gosh, I couldn't even get that first word out there. Dr. Mark Bauerlein. Let's see, you've been a professor of English at Emory and, of course, senior editor now for some time at First Things, Mark. Uh, I love that podcast. You are so, I don't know, you just like you're right on it. You're bringing all kinds of folks to the table and making sure that this conversation that we're talking about really does extend into the next generation. Um, I am so happy that you're here with us, Mark. Thank you for joining us this morning. Well, I'm happy to join you. I'm happy to work with Great Hearts and the Institute at any time. Uh, you're, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the timely thing. And as I often reiterate when I talk to people about classical education, you've got a real good trend when it comes to numbers. The demand is growing for classical education, and it's it's stronger than than you have the resources to meet, isn't it? Well, it is. You know, when I joined the organization nine years ago, there were about 7,000 students in 16 schools right here in Phoenix. I couldn't believe it when I heard about it. I thought, streams in the desert, what is this? You know, why didn't I know about it? But since that time, we have more than tripled our numbers. Today, this fall, We've got 27,000 students in three metropolitan areas in 40 schools, Mark, 40 schools. It's really a boom town out here in the Southwest. It, it's especially inspiring to me because I, I went into the academic humanities as a graduate student in the 1980s. I went into English and I was at Emory University for 30 years. And just to give you the opposite trend taking place in academia in the humanities, in 1970, one out of every 12 or 13 bachelor's degrees in America was granted in the field of English. Mm -hmm. English majors made up about 8% of the entire college population. One in 12 or 13. English was at the center of undergraduate education and the humanities broadly. Uh, in 2019, that number one in 13 had fallen to less than one in 50. Hmm. The humanities over the course of my career shrunk. The students have voted with their feet. The reasons are, are many, but I put one of the top reasons being the abandonment of the classical model in the academic humanities, the turn toward ever more contemporary uh, works, toward more contemporary theory, and then the focus on social issues more than literary history. Mm -hmm. Socialists as being race and sex, all the identity issues that have actually turned a lot of students who might have been English majors, turned them away toward somewhere else. They came into college and they had a great high school English teacher who made them fired up about Dickens or Hemingway or Jane Austen. And they got into the academic humanities and found that the great joys and illuminations of those masterworks were not the focus of the class. The joy was gone. Hmm. Uh, identity politics has no sense of humor. We know this. Uh, it's not about inspiration. It's really about questioning inspiration, critical thinking about our loves and devotions. And, you know, that's fine once you reach a certain level of your education. That's fine for the graduate seminars. But for the freshman and sophomore who's just coming out of school, going into the big wide world, uh, away from family for the first time, and looking to experience great things, big things, and finding these classes are kind of a downer. They lose 
that that inspiring experience that they got in the high school classroom and they go somewhere else. Mm. I would say that one of the draws of the more classical liberal education model, like we see at Great Hearts and other classical schools, is precisely the return to the profundity and the brilliance, the genius of the masterpieces, mm. those things that have survived the centuries and that we first must go with the young person's natural inclination toward reverence, toward appreciation. Those are good feelings, mm. Robert. Gratitude. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. stuff is so great. I am so happy that I know the story of, of Odysseus returning home mm -hmm. and, and bending that bow. I am so happy that I have in my sensibility uh, Mozart and Beethoven. Even if you know they're 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 jaded, they're teenagers, they're Americans with their with their iPhones, and they're they're caught up on TikTok videos. I think actually they they do naturally respect hmm. those works of the ages, and that for us not to provide them, well, they they make their judgment and, and they go somewhere else. But hmm. they're coming back, and I think that speaks to a natural hunger in the 15 and 16 year old for what you have to offer in your curriculum. Well, I, I appreciate that, Mark, because I think you're, you're, you're onto something. We need to appeal right, to the students and to their families at that visceral level. What does bring us pleasure? Why is it that great works have stood the test of time? Uh, there is, to, to use Chesterton's fine phrase, a democracy that we must attend to uh, beyond those of uh, of our contemporaries, the democracy of the dead. They have voted that these works are somehow extraordinary. Their excellence uh, suggests that we should attend to them that and that we will benefit, right? Again, let's just appeal to folks at the most basic level. What do you like? What do you see here? What are you what are you sensing as you enter into these works of imaginative literature? into into times past and that's the way we were hoping to bring liberal arts and the humanities uh, to the next generation now you have spent some time mark at the national endowment for the arts uh back at the beginning of the the 21st century in the early 2000s you were working there i believe when the poet dana joya was leading the nea and uh you've seen some of the ups and downs in humanities education as it's translated through standards here in the u.s so I'd love to hear a little bit more about what you saw there and how you would compare what we would assume is higher education's trajectory, as you just described it, towards a more cynical outlook. And, uh, and really, as you said, the students voting with their feet, they've, they've sort of thrown their hands up. Uh, if the humanities are in decline in higher ed, what is their status in K-12 education generally? What I've learned is that what happens in higher ed does filter down. It makes its way into standards. The general principles of theory, we'll just put it under that umbrella term, of the 70s and 80s and 90s have been translated into, into standards for the 21st century. And I saw this happening. I saw the process taking place at the National Endowment for the Arts. In the early 90s, arts educators came up with a set of standards. And this was following the standards movement in general in education that came in the 1980s, especially after that report, uh, A Nation at Risk, came out and the whole accountability uh, regime was created with testing and standards and, and, and budgets following uh, their performance from the federal government. Now, in the early 90s, the arts educators came up with some standards that actually had some good art history in the standards. They mentioned Shakespeare. They mentioned the ancients, classical drama. They also had the skills uh, of, of creating art and, and knowing how to, how to uh, 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 divide the different art forms, but also 
know a little bit about Greece and Rome, know something about the Renaissance. And I think this was very, very important for young people. Mm -hmm. We want to give them the long sweep of civilization. We want them to feel like they stand in the shadow of greatness and it's their inheritance. It's mm -hmm. for them. They can engage with the geniuses, the best minds. They can stand there in front of a big image of, of uh, a Bernini statue and they can engage with it. They can know about it. And this knowledge they can take with them. It's going to serve them well 10 years later to have been civilized, have been educated, have been formed by the very best things of human creation. Well, unfortunately, in the arts and in the other humanities fields, this focus on tradition was discredited. And we know the usual reasons why, you know, the past had forms of discrimination and bias and, and, and some identities were suppressed and the West is responsible for a lot of crimes in the world with expansion and colonialism and slavery. Oh, slavery was everywhere. It's not a Western phenomenon, but this sufficiently discredited Western civilization to lead the putatively most advanced teachers and theorists to adopt, as you said, a cynical perspective mm. toward the past. They were progressive. And what does progressivism do? It casts the past as an inferior time. That's why they're progressive. We've got to move away from a time of injustice and create a time of justice. And that puts the past, once again, in a guilty framework. So why should we have students read Ezra Pound's poetry? Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy was, the guy loved Mussolini. He was a traitor to America. So he's a bad guy. Let's get rid of his poetry. Even though all the other poets in Anglo-American world in the 20th century said Pound is one of the greatest. Mm -hmm. Pound was my inspiration. Nope. You're you're out. That is a political application of political norms toward aesthetic objects. Mm -hmm. But, you know, progressivism doesn't, doesn't make that division. Politics is everywhere. And so the arts educators came up with new standards about 10 years ago to replace those 1990 standards. And Robert, the, 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 the art history side is gone, right? it's all going to be about identity and it's all about certain skills and, and meaning making in, in art. And the, the long shadow of the heritage is gone. And unfortunately, this has happened in, in English and the, the humanities as well, broadly, because, and this is what I found being in standards meetings and mingling with educators with, the decay of the curriculum, the traditional curriculum during the course of the 80s and 90s and aughts, a lot of the people now teaching in the humanities at the secondary level, they didn't get a good humanistic education themselves. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that if you say to them, as I've said in meetings before, listen, we've got to have John Dryden represented in this curriculum. Dryden is one of the great wits in all of English literature. And then I look around the room and Robert, I realize none of these people have read John Dryden. They've never read him. Yeah. They don't know right. it. Right. And they get nervous because when you say to them, John Dryden, when they talk about Western civilization being, being racist and sexist, you say to them, but what about, what about Beethoven's fifth? What about, what about, what about the prelude to, to Wagner's Tannhauser? They haven't heard it. They don't know it. So that, that you can't argue with. Yeah, if well, you can't. Feel, they feel nervous right. being in the room there. I've made them feel badly. And you want to say, you know, the parents understand this and they don't want their own kids mm. to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. 
you know, it's uh, the point is well taken and you should take it easy on them, right? I mean, I'm sure their feelings are on the line. They are feeling a bit insecure, no doubt, in those meetings if they're unfamiliar with these works of greatness. At the same time, if there are leaders, uh, we do need to hold them accountable. Perhaps we just need to erect an alternative, uh, some institutions like our own that are, are promoting the works uh, that have stood the test of time, as I said. When you were there at the NEA, uh, you you detailed some of this, by the way, for us, and you've been a regular, a mainstay at our uh, at our gathering, the National Symposium for Classical Education, and I I thank you for your your consistent contribution. But this last spring, when we were discussing the fine arts, you took a close look and drew from your time at the NEA, and you mentioned in, in at one particular point in your talk that you heard uh, an educationist speak in the following way. And you said, he said, I don't teach a subject. I teach kids. Now you spent some time in your talk unpacking that. Perhaps you could explain to us what's in that statement. What does it assume about art education? I don't teach a subject. I teach kids. Isn't that plain spoken enough? What's behind that? You, you know, the person who said that, it was in, a, it was in a, a meeting, the person who said that, not only did the sentence have uh, a semantic value, it also had an emotional value for him. When he said that, he felt so good about saying it. This is what often finds about progressive educators. They, they feel so virtuous about their position. They're very happy with themselves for being on the right side of history. In, in these matters. And we know what he really means. He means this is a child-centered approach to learning. It's not about the stuff. It's about the formation of, of the, the young mind, the young sensibility. And when we see this Rousseauistic focus uh, upon the, the person, the child, and less upon the content, the subject matter, what we get is, among other things, low test score results, right? We are not giving young people the cultural literacy that they need to understand those passages that are chosen on the ACT and SAT exams. We focus on things like self-esteem, and with which, by the way, when they survey kindergartners, kindergarten teachers, and ask them, what are the main goals of your instruction? The teachers put self-esteem, number one. When they survey the parents of those kindergartners, the parents talk about learning, starting to learn to read, doing a little pronunciation work. The parents are not about the children. They are about the material to be learned. The parents, though, self-esteem. Now, we do know that self-esteem-focused education has absolutely no evidence as a productive pedagogy. A lot of very high-performing kids don't have very great self-esteem. They're very self-critical, which is, in fact, instrumental to... Mm -hmm. They're learning things. So the, the uh, to me, what stood out was not so much the, the pithy expression of the child-centered approach as really it was really the self-satisfaction hmm. in, in yeah. looking at things that way, as if people like us who say, no, no, I don't teach uh, the, the 11th grade teenager. I I teach Alexander Pope. I teach Emily Dickinson. That's what I want. That's what I care about. And I care about them learning mm. that stuff because I think it's good for them. I think yeah. it's well, very and yet, good for them. Well, and ironically, true esteem for the young person is found in the very competence and understanding of these works when they That's can right. read, when they are culturally literate, when they can identify an illusion found in a text. 
they they feel thrilled, right? They 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 can truly wonder at that which is there before them. And I I, I suspect it's really a false dichotomy: the idea that the child and the child's esteem is somehow in juxtaposition or opposition, right, to the work to be done where yeah. we learn in these classrooms. That you being know, said, you go ahead, go ahead. When I was at the Arts Endowment, uh, Dana Joya created a program called Poetry Out Loud. Hmm. It was a national poetry recitation contest. And it was modeled on the National Spelling Bee, which is an intense national competition mm -hmm. where kids have to get up and, and spell the words. Here, kids had to get up and recite a poem by memory and act it out. And we had judges saying, who is doing the best rendition? And not only did we do this, but we created a poetry list. Uh, a lot of the Arts Council people wanted us to allow students to recite their own poems, their own creations. Dana said, no, we're going to give them choices of Shakespeare, uh, John Donne, Ezra Pound. We're going to give them a lot, I mean, a lot of choices, but from the traditional corpus. All the way up, not too many contemporaries, not, not mm -hmm. them, because mm -hmm. we wanted them to go back. Right. And it was enormously popular. Uh, thousands and thousands of kids have participated. And that memorization process, I've seen it at work because in my college classes, my freshman classes, when I'm teaching introduction to poetry or when I'm, I'm teaching freshman composition, I would make students memorize poems and then the next day have to come back into class and recite them in front of the class. Rob, they hated it. <laughs> oh, it was agony for them, which only made me double up the assignment. But the uh, the the unusual task for them uh, really daunted them. And they kind of complained and they were nervous about it. Not only the memorization, but standing up in front of the class, not me, in front of their peers mm -hmm. and recite it. And they would get up, you know, sometimes they would stumble and I'd say, wait, 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 you know think, pause. Maybe we'd give the student up there a one syllable clue. And the student who got through it, the agony on the way back to her seat, a genuine expression of accomplishment, mm -hmm. relief, but also I did it. I did something and I finished the task a little applause, and I deserved it because I did the real thing. That's that's a case where of what you what you just said. First of all, what did the memorization do? One, I had to I had to memorize a lot of words, and I don't do that a lot. I had to learn some words that I didn't know before because that poem contains a lot of diction that is unfamiliar to me. That's a very good exercise for adolescents to do. I also had to get into character. I had mm -hmm. to become. Emily Dickinson for two minutes. That's another very positive thing for our egotistical, narcissistic adolescent, as all adolescents are. It's very good for them to do. It builds what's called cognitive empathy, the mm. capacity, not sympathy, empathy to get inside another person's head, even if you don't like that person, even mm -hmm. though that person is an evil character. You watch Shakespeare's Richard III, mm. one of the brilliant things that Shakespeare does is bring you inside this murderous villain. Mm -hmm. We get to know his thoughts. We, we engage in cognitive empathy, even as we abhor what he's doing, we have to imagine what is running through his head. This is actually very good training for life in an open society, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. To under, we've got to have a little thicker skin in an open society, and we've got to try to understand where people are coming from. We can't just, you know, condemn. You're good. You're bad. You're racist. You're 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 one of the virtuous ones. I mean, what a shallow conception mm -hmm. of human being we have here. Well, I think that's right. I think the 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 tendency to identify folks as good or bad in total. Right, just a totalizing critique 
is is really doing our society a disservice because as I'm fond of quoting Solzhenitsyn, that line between good and evil, that's right here, right? That's right here down the middle of every human heart. So how are we helping young people to discern their own inclination towards goodness and that propensity, right? There's an opportunity there. I've got to make choices. Uh, could I, in fact, take a pathway that would leave, lead me into darkness? Possibly, if I think along these lines, we should teach them where that line rests right in the middle of their chest. So I, I'm interested also in the fact that you have given us because your your critique of the of the standards, you've given us thought on what we might be able to do and how to remedy this. So what might we do to enrich the lives of students and equip teachers of the arts to really promote the perennial tradition of excellence? What would you recommend? One thing our teachers must believe is that what they teach, and I'm speaking of the, the humanities classes in, in my, my area, what they must believe is that the great materials of the past are going to serve their students very well when their students get older. Mm -hmm. That education in the French word is formation, right? Formation. You are what you read. You know, John Ruskin said, tell me what you like and I'll tell you who you are. Mm -hmm. And what we want to do is equip students for the better things, the better experiences. If you eat at McDonald's all the time and then you 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 get, you know, a free ticket to Paris and you, and you go into a restaurant uh, like Taillefon, they're going to you're going to have one of the best meals, you know, in, in the world. And you won't even notice. You won't know. You will have no capacity to have an experience like that simply because you haven't been formed for it. The teachers must have confidence that, that reading Emily Dickinson, reading Richard III is good for the students. Mm -hmm. You are doing a great thing for them. I mean, we could even be utilitarian about it. If you give the students, your students, that rich, civilizing background that includes, let's say, you know, the King James Bible, one of the great works of English literature. Those students who go into freshman classes at the college level, they're going to have a background knowledge that gives them a great advantage over the students sitting next to them that didn't get that background knowledge because the King James Bible is all over American history, American politics. Read Abraham Lincoln's speeches. Mm -hmm. My goodness, King James is everywhere. The metaphors, you see a house divided, you will know what it means. You'll know the background. The student sitting next to you won't. And let's face it, in college, it's a competitive environment. You are compared to, by the teacher, you're compared to the other students sitting next to you. When you apply to graduate school, you are compared to the other students who are applying to graduate school. So the college readiness factor, absolutely classical education is a better approach than the more oriented toward the president, contemporary issues, social matters, progressivist approach is. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that we're getting more and more research now that shows the classical students doing very well when they when they go to college and also actually, you know, the, the kind of lives that, that mm. they lead. Because your students are going to face difficulties when they grow up. You know, the, the, the girl you loved her, she was perfect and she dumped you. Okay. If you have great love stories of the past, including stories of rejection with Dido and Aeneas or Odysseus and Calypso or, or all the way up to Gatsby and Daisy, you're going to have a reservoir. There'll be a background against which you can just have a little more understanding of this disappointment than you would if 
all you had were, you know, contemporary uh, Marvel movies mm -hmm. and, and those ridiculous, you know, juvenile love stories that we see in, the, in those films. You can just have a depth of understanding. It's going to help you deal with disappointment. You know, you didn't, you didn't get, you didn't get that school you wanted to go to for business, you know, get your MBA. You didn't make the cut. Well, a good, a few stories of disappointment, like death of a salesman. Again, it would, it would temper the shock and it would give you an understanding for what's happening. And you wouldn't be so reactive to, to things. And I think what we see now is so many young Americans are, are in their twenties, early thirties and millennials, that there's a sour mood out there. And I think a lot of it is due to the fact that they have no foundations. They have no roots. They have no historical sense of themselves, of where they stand in time and history because they didn't get what great hearts and other schools like that offer. Mm. Sad to say that's true, but hopefully with our continued growth and the growth of the classical renewal movement, more students, more families are going to be enriched with this tradition. And I I think you're you're right to say that not only do we need to have a very sound intellectual formation of these young people, but in so doing and doing well, we're actually equipping them for the emotional maturity they will need for life. And uh, and that brings me great comfort. Mark, I got to thank you. Uh, this time with you and your continued encouragement of what we're doing uh, within this classical renewal uh, makes a good bit of difference. We need you to speak to those teachers just as you did a moment ago and say, be confident, right? What you're bringing to those young people is going to outfit them for life. Thanks again for your time with us, Professor Bauerlein. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, and I will see you soon in February. In February. Join us next Tuesday with the wonderful, the amazing Professor Carol, who will help us explore the joys and the delights of music. Until then, have a great day. Registration for the 2023 National Symposium for Classical Education is now open. Join us February 22nd through the 24th in Phoenix, Arizona for three days of unsurpassed scholarship, professional workshops, and networking opportunities. For more information, visit www.greathearts.institute. Working together to renew the tradition.